Hello everyone. I thought I'd do a, a video on the National Army Museum using um, some footage that I took two years ago um, as, as we're in a kind of lockdown situation now. I'm going to be a little bit short of material as I was not able to get out and about so much and at the time I, I didn't feel this uh, footage was particularly good quality but uh, I'm, I'm beginning to change my mind now because uh, I, I think it will be of interest to people, um, people war gamers in particular but people with an interest in military history. Um, so at, at the start I've got uh, quite a few still photos which I'll, I'll talk over um, and then I'll run the video footage without actually narrating over it just so that you can see um, some moving images um, yeah so it, it's a very uh, underrated museum I think the, the National Army Museum um, people who go to London um, who, who are of uh, a military interest sort of mind tend to head straight for the Imperial War Museum um, but that really only deals with military history from the Great War onwards whereas the National Army Museum um, has uh, things of interest, artefacts, paintings, um, uniforms, all, all kinds of material documents, illustrations and, and sketches and really interesting artefacts from various wars dating right back to the restoration in 1660. Um, it was Charles II who first uh, established sort of standing regiments for the army. Um, so the oldest regiments in the army date back no later than the end of the 17th century. Uh, so if you've got any kind of interest in any uh, conflict that the British Army took part in from then up until the present day, including you know the era that the Imperial War Museum cover, then you're much better off going to the National Army Museum, I think. It's uh, a far more uh, uh, comfortable kind of environment to be in. I mean, it's, it's smaller, so it hasn't got room for tanks and planes and all that kind of thing, but it, 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 equally it's a lot less crowded and you don't get parties of school kids and uh, and so on going past. Um, so, as you can see, uh, there's there's a whole there's, a, there's about four floors, and each floor has got a slightly different setup. Um, this this is pretty random uh, selection of photos. You can see on that this one here the reason why. I, I despaired of them because there's, there, there's a lot of reflections in the glass and so on and didn't think it was suitable for um, public view. But as I say, I've changed my mind now. Um, yeah, so the, the, the things it's very strong on, I would say, are um, the colonial conflicts. So we're looking at... Um, uh, a shako worn by an Indian sepoy here at around the dating from around 1840. So it's very good. It's very good for all the kind of colonial wars like the Zulu War and the Boer War. Um, I think of Terry Quick. I didn't notice too much on the Sudan, but I'm sure it's in there. Uh, the Indian Mutiny, um, and it's equally good for um, the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, but as you can see, there's, there are sort of genuine relics dating back, you know, this is an 18th century drummer's mitre, uh, dragoon helmet from 1830, another mitre helmet. But some of the things in here... Um, I'm really sort of doing this little introduction of it with some stills so that I don't have to talk over the moving images and you, you'll know more or less what you're looking at when when I show you those. Um, it's very kind of 
um, they, they, they've selected their artifacts quite um, and the objects to display quite carefully so that they've, they, it draws you into a sort of personal uh, connection with, with things that are fairly kind of uh, inanimate like this Victoria Cross so this one has got particular history in that uh, it was awarded to someone in 1857 during the Indian Mutiny but he then um, they, 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 it's always been the case that the the, 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 the the decoration can be withdrawn and taken back and but when he was convicted for stealing his uncle's cow in 1862 his name was James Maguire um, he actually lost the Victoria Cross it was uh, confiscated from him Lots of artwork, lots of paintings, some by quite famous uh, painters such as Frith and so on. This, forget who painted this one, but this is a well-known painting of uh, troops embarking to sail for the Crimean War. So you often see it in history books of the Crimean War. Uh, again, this is another little uh, personal touch. There, there, there were this. This was in a section talking about. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that. It, 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 it deals with a lot of difficult issues, um, you know, in, in a quite sort of frank and open way. I mean, clearly, uh, when you're showing artefacts and describing the history of a lot of our colonial conflicts, um, you know, th there's now a kind of uh, uh, a lot of discomfort about, about that because you're actually presenting it to a population which... Um, you know, is is descended from the uh, the colonised as well as as well as the colonists, and um, they they deal with all these these matters quite openly and and uh, frankly. And, and, and it's not a kind of jingoistic kind of uh, display. That's what that's what I could say. But you, you, can, you can see here, this was um, a piece of patchwork that was um, done in a lunatic asylum by a veteran of the Crimean War who um, never recovered from the effects of uh, conflict and, and spent 20 years in an asylum before dying. Um, it, it, you know, for those of you who are wanting to kind of research uniforms as well, it's, it's brilliant. This, this is a sort of Hazars uniform from about the time of the Crimean War. This is a, a gown actually worn by Lawrence of Arabia which is uh, quite topical for me. I should have been on holiday in Jordan following Lawrence of Arabia's campaign trail last week. Um, I would have got back yesterday had the uh, coronavirus not, not struck. Lots of uh, things brought back from the days of the East India Company. Um, the thing on the left there is, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's used by the uh, person um, controlling an elephant, ivory chess pieces from the same kind of period, brought back from uh, India and traded. They're, they've been given permission to not to destroy this chess piece. It's a fa fantastic uh, collection of, of items, but they're in ivory and uh, museums have to get special permission to retain objects of significant sort of interest rather than uh, burn them all now in order to prevent any illegal trade in ivory. Plenty of uh, medals and so on. Um, there's something dating back to the time of Charles II. And as I say, lots of, lots of very uh, poignant kind of reminders of historic events. So this this bugle was actually um, used at the Battle of Waterloo, but, but they've also got another one. Um, I think I've got an image of it coming up later that was actually um, blown at the charge of the heavy brigade during the Battle of Balaclava in the Crimea. Um, lots of remains and of. Um, uh, um, beloved kind of horses that had a particular role in military history. So this was, um, 
a horse called Jock, who uh, the hoof of a horse called Jock, who uh, charged at, in the uh, at the Battle of Waterloo, and when when he died in 1836, it says the hooves were removed as mementos, mementos, and he's actually the horse itself remains were buried in Hyde Park. I think that's the Waterloo Medal. Not entirely sure. This is a captured dragoon's. Uh, armour from the Napoleonic Wars, French Dragoons armour. It's really, it's really interesting seeing the genuine article rather than copies or reproductions of these things. Um, there's a lot of regimental silverware in there. Um, this one uh, was sort of put on the table during regimental meals and so on. Uh, formal occasions, so it's depicting a heroic action of uh, a, a soldier saving the colour during the Peninsula War. Despite a cut face, a severed arm and a lance wound, he refused to let go of the colour. This, again, this is another relic of a horse. This one is actually Napoleon's horse, Marengo, um, captured at Waterloo and uh, held prisoner, I suppose, you might say, until it died in 1831. But that is, that is the actual horse, or the skeleton of the actual horse that Napoleon rode at Waterloo and other battles. Bust of Napoleon. Right, now, um, these, these pictures are particularly poor quality, and that's because um, it's the, a model of the Battle of Waterloo, a very famous model, but um, it's so kind of uh, delicate and aged now that they have to keep it in fairly dull lighting conditions. So it's very difficult to get a good picture of it. But um, there are two models by a chap called Captain Cyborn, who uh, enthusiasts of the Napoleonic Wars would probably know. They're, they're models of the Battle of Waterloo and um, he was commissioned originally to make one in the 1830s and uh, he it, it's a mod it's a i would say probably six mil scale massive massive table it must be about i don't know 18 foot square something like that um every regiment and and landmark accurately portrayed on it but its significance really is that in order to get the accuracy, Cyborn wrote to as many surviving officers of the battle that he could contact in, in the 1830s and get them to describe the battle and um, give, try and give an accurate account of what, where they were and what they saw at, at each particular hour. Um, and um, I mean, on this one here, you, you, as I say, it's very poor quality, and you see, so you can't make it up. But that is actually Hoogmont in the middle there, and the, and the sort of smaller dark squares are actually regiments of figures, um, but you can't make them out on this, unfortunately. But yeah, but the, but 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 really, a lot of what we know about the Battle of Waterloo, and the reason why there's so much um, explanation of it and detailed descriptions of it is, is due to the research that Cyborn did at the time. Um, the, 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 the project, he, he lost the um, funding for it and had to put it on public display and lost a lot of money. Um, but his solution to that was to um, try again and put another, build another model. He had them on display in uh, in Piccadilly, in a in a sort of uh, exhibition hall called the um, the Egyptian Hall, um, one of the models is now in the National Army Museum, and the other one is up in Leeds in the Royal Armouries Museum. Um, they've been restored over the years a number of times. The, the last time I went to the National Army Museum prior to this, they'd um, recently restored one of the models, and they said that. Uh, They'd had to clear rats' nests out of it and all that kind of thing. They were in a pretty poor, shoddy condition. Um, but it was a complete financial disaster for Cyborn. Um, the one theory is that the reason he lost the funding was that um, 
the the model that he made uh, diverged from the description that Wellington had um, given of the battle. Um, um, so there was a kind of uh, he he was basically um, uh, kind of not disciplined but uh, shunned in a way and lost fell out of favour. Um, so he had to then had to try and privatise the model, make some money out of it. Uh, oh, this is the this is the bugle that was used to sound the charge of the heavy brigade at Balaclava. This is uh, again from the Crimean War. This Raglan, who lost his arm at the Battle of Waterloo, um, commanded the Allied forces in the Crimea. Um, only had one arm, so he. Um, had this telescope mounted onto a rifle stock or a musket stock so that he could use it with one arm. Someone's Shaco from Thomas Sutton's Shaco from the Charge of the Light Brigade. William Gordon's uh, jacket from the Charge of the Light Brigade, blood stained. This is the actual note, not a copy, the actual note that Nolan took down and delivered to Lucan that uh, prompted the charge of the Light Brigade, the, the badly written and badly worded note that um, left Lucan ordering the Light Brigade to attack the guns at the end of the valley rather than the ones that were being carried away from the redoubts on the hilltop that they couldn't see. Um, so Nolan, who delivered this letter, was the first person to die during the charge. It's just, it's just amazing to see this thing, you know, in, in real life. Signed by Airy rather than by Raglan. But he, he writes, Lord Raglan uh, wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front. <laughs> uh, this is another Crimean War, the Duke of Cambridge's uh, coatie. Another coat from the Crimean War. I think that's a, a whip down the bottom there. And again more from the same similar era, the Albert Shaco at the top. This is from the Zulu Wars, the Martini Henry cartridge and a water bottle that you might recognise the shape of if you've painted up British figures for the Anglo-Zulu Wars. Uniform, shield and Martini Henry rifle and the knobkerry. All genuine, you know, not, not reproductions, all genuine dating back to the time of the war. Um, not a good picture, but this is the famous Frith painting of the Battle of Zandwana. You often see illustrations of this. It's it, totally inaccurate. The British never actually form a square like that. But um, this was the sort of Victorian perception and portrayal of the battle. Another kind of genuine artefact. This was the radio message that... Urquhart, Urquhart wrote to Browning um, at the Battle of Arnhem. So Urquhart was, if you've ever seen A Bridge Too Far, Urquhart was played by Sean Connery and Browning by Dirk Bogard in that. But it, it's dis describing his desperate situation. Must warn you, unless physical contact in strength is made with us early 25th of September, Consider it unlikely we can hold out long enough. This is the uh, medal roll of uh, Colonel Jones, who died during the uh, Falklands War, including his VC that he won posthumously. Uh, oh yeah, now talking of VCs, this is uh, quite a famous character, um, Walter Hamilton, who won the VC 
um, during the Afghan war and, and his, in 1878, the second, I think that's the second Afghan war. Uh, it, it, it's quite um, a, an unusual uh, medal award as well as being a, an unusual statue um, and an unusual story because he died, he died at the, um, the siege of the embassy in Kabul along with Sir Louis Cavignari. Um, he was awarded the VC, but in those days, up until 1908, in fact, um, you had to survive in order to be awarded the VC. There was no such thing as a posthumous VC. Um, the VCs that were awarded during the Anglo-Zulu uh, War at the Battle of Isandwana to the two that tried to um, carry off the, the colours and died, they were only actually retrospectively awarded um, in... 1908. What were their names? Melville and uh, Coghill was that? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this particular VC that uh, Walter Hamilton uh, was awarded, um, he didn't he, he didn't get it for dying at the defending the, the the embassy, which a lot of people think he did. What happened was that there was an action on the way into Afghanistan where he was recommended for the VC for his uh, bravery um, in this particular incident and he was turned down for it. And then when he actually was killed later in the campaign, um, the, the military authorities sort of changed their mind thought he deserved the VC but he couldn't be awarded it for dying so he had to be awarded it for that previous action that he took part in um, so it's a kind of strange uh, anomaly of in the history of the VC but anyway Walter Hamilton if you've ever seen um, the uh, or read the read the book by MMK, the Far Pavilions, or seen the mini series that was on in the nineteen eighties. I think it was nineteen eighty four. Um, there, there's a character in that, um, in the Queen's Corps of Guides, uh, who who is uh, who depicts Walter Hamilton. is is played by Benedict Taylor. Um, if you saw the TV series and. Uh, Known, it is sort of affectionately known as Wally in the in the story, but that actually is um, based on the character of Walter Hamilton. Some of the some of the characters are fictitious, and some are, are historic characters. Um, if you're short of something to do in the in the lockdown during the lockdown, I can highly recommend the Far Pavilions, the novel by M. N. K. The, the TV series was a bit of a disappointment. It was very kind of woodenly acted and, and the story was chopped up and changed and parts of it um, run into... So two characters would be blended into one and so on to get it down to a decent um, length for a TV show. But yeah, I mean, the book is absolutely wonderful book. It's, I mean, it's been compared to some of Rudyard Kipling's work and so on. It's just wonderful story going right through from the Indian Mutiny up to um, the sort of 1880s in, in India. Um, life and action on the frontier and so on. But this particular statue, I mean you can see here it's it's a bit of a controversial statue. I mean it was originally in Dublin, Pro probably moved from there I would guess when Ireland became an independent country. Um, and for a long time was actually outside the National Army Museum, but it was constantly being vandalised because it's got this portrayal of um, Hamilton um, stepping on a, a, a Muslim kind of fighter and so on. Um, so it's now inside the museum. They, they refurbished the museum a few years ago now and um, moved, decided to move it inside where it wouldn't be... Um, vandalised any longer but it's still you know a, a little bit uh, contentious in its in its depiction of, of uh, British kind of triumphalism in a way 
This is another uh, bronze of the Duke of Cumberland. So this is uh, from the period of the Jacobite, 1745 Jacobite Rebellion. Charles Gordon of Khartoum, one for Terry there. So there are a few things in there to do with Khartoum. Not many that I can recall. And that is the end of the slideshow. So what I'll do now is run the um, run the videos and let you just watch those on your own. Yeah, but if you if when we get when you next get a chance and it's open again, I highly recommend the National Army Museum.